Thank you, my friends. Mm, 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 mm. I was wondering what many of you were thinking when, uh, when you found out a math professor was talking this morning. I probably can guess the first word that came to your mind. Awesome. That's right. So uh, one of the things I have struggled with for so many years is, uh, is the way math and art can fit together. And if you sort of think about artists in one camp and mathematicians on the other one, many of you who don't like math can or most of you have a bad experience at one point or another, can probably remember the last math class you've taken. Right? It's, uh, oh man, that was trig, that was algebra. You can sort of actually remember the date that you had to hand in the last dumb quiz and you never had to look at it again. And uh, this is not true for almost any other subject. Right? When you graduate, go off, and somebody says, what was the last English class you've taken? Many of you probably will not, oh, was it Shakespeare? Was it Chaucer? Like, I don't remember what the last English class was. But it's actually truly remarkable that students know exactly the last math class they've taken. It's kind of like a painful experience. But if you look at what, uh, what these kind of things have been about, let me show you this picture of Leonardo da Vinci. Right? Now, during the time of the Renaissance, da Vinci was one of the gods that reigned the earth. And let me show you one of the reasons why. Here's some of the things that he did, right? You know the work of the Mona Lisa as a painter, as an artist, exemplary. And then he's actually an amazing botanist and a biologist. Right? He would take cadavers, study the human anatomy, understand how people's arms and limbs would work. But at the same time, you realize that he's an engineer. He cares about proportions, he was designing helicopters, he's designing you know, catapults and catamarans to launch certain things. And what I love about da Vinci is not that he was three different things, but he was one person doing all of them. And what I mean by that is this. You see, even in his sketches as a scientist and as a botanist, you could see incredible art. See, he never took his artistic cap off and put a scientific cap on. He just kept it on all the time. And when he was talking about the Mona Lisa, when he was looking at engineering stuff, his art and math and engineering and interests in science and nature, and they were just everywhere covered. So the goal is, how do you bring that back today? So let me show you this amazing equation. It's called the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. It's the greatest math theorem that talks about shape that I know of. Here's what it is. All right. Some of you, I know, are getting excited. Uh, but let me actually describe what this is. So this is integral. Integral just means add up, right? All this is is if you add up all the curviness over a point on a surface, it's going to be 2 pi times the Euler characteristic of a surface. All right, let me bring that down a little bit more. Take a sphere, right? Take how curvy every point on the sphere is and add it all up, and the number you're going to get is 4 pi. No big deal. But if I take the sphere like, like a rubber and just stretch it like a balloon, the curviness has changed at different points but the total curviness is still going to be 4 pi. If I take that sphere and I step on it and twist it around, the curviness is changing everywhere. You're poking holes and ripping and pulling, but the total curvature is still 4 pi. It's one of the most amazing things I've ever known. Although a few of us are getting turned on at this point, many of us are just shut off. In fact, you'd probably agree with Stephen Colbert, who says, equations are the devil sentences. So, you know, how do we get this way? You know, how do we get to the point where, um, where when we view something like an equation, which is supposed to describe this incredibly beautiful visual thing, that we're getting nauseous thinking about it? Now, what, what happened? And I'll tell you one reason why. One of the reasons why are mathematicians ourselves. We're the problem, right? So there's a guy named John Littlewood, superstar mathematician, turn of the last century. He's a number theorist. This is the guy you'd you'd least expect to draw anything, right? He only cares about numbers. He's not into shapes. He just wants to understand prime numbers, their structures, Riemann hypothesis, these beautiful things. And here's what he writes in this little book called Miscellany. He writes, a heavy warning used to be given that pictures are not rigorous. This has never had its bluff called and has permanently frightened its victims. What he means by that is this. We think that somehow if you have an algebraic equation, if you have an analytic notation, it's somehow more true, more right, more clear than any picture you can draw. Look, hey, kid, come here. If you want to draw a picture, go sit in that corner and play around all you want to. But if you want to do real stuff, we talk about equations. And you see, because of that idea that started about 200 years ago and has pushed us into it, we have torn the notion of what it means to do art 
and visual design away from the notion of what it means to do science and math. And that has hurt us. Let me give you an example. These four things, I, these are actually pictures from my work, right? I drew these things. And these are four-dimensional objects. There are four of them. You guys know what two-dimensional objects are? They're like polygons, flat things you can draw on a piece of paper. 3D objects is like a cube. Um, it's like a tetrahedron or a dodecahedron, you know, things you like roll the dice with. Those are 3D kind of things. And these are 4D. You know that they look creepier than 3D, right? So there's something else going on. So here's my question to you. My question to you is a really simple question. What is the mathematical proof that these four things are actually the same? All right? <laughs> What's the proof? That's the question, right? You have four of these guys. It turns out they look completely different. What's the proof that they're the same? And here's the proof. Ready for this, my friends? The proof is this, the picture. That's the proof. That's it. So you might be looking at me going, dude, but I don't understand it. But like, how am I supposed to figure it out? And the answer is, you suck, right? You're just really, really bad at understanding and manipulating 4D things. But many of you are really bad doing algebra. Many of you are really bad drawing a line. I had students, they say, could you draw a circle for me? They're like, oh, oh my goodness. And they just get totally nervous. <laughs> it's all right. You're not gifted that way. It's OK. But this is the proof. You don't need to look for an equation. You don't need to look for a notation. You don't need to look for an algebraic analysis. The picture is the proof. That has everything you need. You might not be good at it, but it's right there. How do we get this way? Littlewood's idea of, uh, of just us fearing pictures to talk about reality. The Renaissance was this time that da Vinci existed. And here's what we know about the Renaissance, right? That math and art fit together. It was actually a time that faith and reason existed together. It was a time that religion and politics existed together. Let me just explain to you about religion and politics, just for a second, right? Because it's kind of a hot topic once in a while. Look, the way we view religion, the way I view religion is the answer to your big questions. Who are we? What are we doing here? What's our purpose? These are the big, everyone has an answer to these big questions. There's nothing called a non-religious person. Everybody has answers to this thing. And if you don't care about the answers to it, that is your religion. The fact that you don't consider those questions important, that's great. We all are religious people. Politics is how do you answer the day-to-day -day questions of life and getting it done. So of course your big questions are going to make you think of the answers to the little questions in a certain way. So for example, let me talk about something. Let me talk about divorce laws. You know, I grew up in south side of India. South side, it's a great place. But there, the divorce laws are completely different than in the States. Right? Regardless of whatever it is, the way we view the big questions in the world is going to affect how I think divorce law should be. For example, should I divorce my wife anytime I want? Should there be certain restrictions on what? How should the restrictions be? They're all going to be related to one another. In India, the following is true, that the fact that the community is more important than who you think you are. So if you want to divorce your wife because things aren't working out, you're actually going to hurt the community and your kids, and that's more important than your personal well-being. So the divorce laws are much harder to make and execute. And that's because of the way the religion is viewed. And what's this, the unmeasurable and the measurable, the things you can quantify and write down and say this is 34, and the things you can't, the things you can't understand about and quantify that easily. But about 200 years ago, 250 years ago, the Enlightenment era came about. And here's what the Enlightenment era did. It didn't say it's one or the other. See, that's what's remarkable. It said it's one versus the other. See, on one side, on one side of this room, you have the kind, the gentle, and the sensitive art major. And on the other side, you have this cold-blooded, calculating math major, right? Just doesn't even speak to humans, doesn't even care, irrelevant. Right? That's these two things. It's not you have to pick art or you have to pick math. It's not just that. It's just you have to pick art and you're against math. What happened? This Enlightenment era is awesome. In some ways, it's awesome because it gave us better medicine, better technology, better understanding, more in-depth. You just can't say you wish the sun was the center of the universe. You have to prove those things. You have to quantify and measure. It's important. But my friends, the Enlightenment hair has gotten pushed too much that it's dangerous. Let me give you a couple of things. I think that the messiness of this world, the fact we're cutting and cleaning things up is what's getting us in trouble. So here's one of the messiest things that I love. Ice cream. It's not just ice cream, by the way, I'm not sure. This is Grater's ice cream. You get this in Ohio. Black raspberry chip. There is so much fat in the chocolate chips that when you bite in it, it is soft. Mmm. <sighs> Whew. 
You see, the messiness of the life is what makes this fantastic. The enlightenment world comes and says we have to quantify, we have to measure, we have to separate. That's awesome. But you separate it so much that you make everything so clean and so sterile. It's the messiness that we're made of. Let me give you something else that's messy. This is my family, right? Uh, yeah, you're going to say that now, but I'm going to tell you some details about it that will make you regret all that thing. So it's, you know, just, this is the dream. You just look, oh, wow, that looks fantastic. There's the New England landscape in the back and the Berkshires. But first of all, you know this is a complete artificial picture, right? I'll tell you why. Those two kids on the right, right, they're 11 and 13. At this picture, they were like, I think, 10 and 8. There are no 10 and 8-year-old brother and sister who look like that. You know this, <laughs> right? It's like totally Photoshopped, right? It's all fake. And then uh, the most important thing you'll notice, first of all, is that my wife, who's sort of in the center of the picture, does not look like me. Already you have incredible mess and pain. There's this woman who was born in the States, grew up in the Chinese culture. I grew up in the south side of India. What are we doing getting together and married? So, right, most people who grew up in the same town argue about which kind of toothpaste to use. And here we are, totally different cultures. It is a mess and painful relationship in terms of how it is. It's a tough thing to get marriage work. So all these three kids you see, great, that, those are, their life is messed up, right, to know whose their identity is. And then you see that little one on my lap, right? This is what she looks like now. That is true. She's my favorite by far. So... <laughs> I tell all of them that she's my favorite by far, anyway, so that's no big deal. Um, Blonde-haired, blue-eyed dream girl, right? Totally in love with her. And can you imagine the question she will have as she grows up? Can you imagine the messiness of her life? Like, who were her birth mother and father? What am I doing in America with this Chinese mom and an Indian dad and weird brothers and sisters? I mean, what, how is this identity going to be? You see, my friends, I wouldn't trade this for anything. This is the messiness of this world. The enlightenment, we've drunk it so much. You see it everywhere. In fact, you're breathing the air right now of it. That it has separated it. The way you even view the world, the way you even view Gordon. You're just separating things into pieces. How can we regain this? So, this is Burton Russell, a superstar mathematician, superstar philosopher. This is drinking the enlightenment straight up. And this is what he says. Remote from human passions, remote even from the pitiful facts of nature, the generations have gradually created an ordered cosmos where pure thought can dwell as in its natural home, where one at least of our nobler impulses can escape from the dreary exile of the actual world. Let's just get away from this pitiful thing called nature. Let's just, let's go into ideas, because that's what matters. That's what college is about. That's what grad school is about. It's about escaping the muck of this thing and going into the reality of what ideas are about. And that's what Burton Russell is making us drink. And you see, it's incredibly dangerous, and it goes against, in a sense, the notion of the Christian faith. I want to tell you that at the end of this. But this is what enlightenment to the extreme comes to. This is why art and math are in conflict with each other today, whether we believe it or not. So let me just show you a couple of snapshots in math currently today that are coming from nature that are amazing. Just amazing windows into the world of math. Right? So this is a work by Stephen Hawking, physicist, superstar. And he wrote this book called The Grand Design. And this is the setup from the Enlightenment viewpoint. Here's what he writes. The universe does not have just a single existence or history, but rather every possible version of the universe exists simultaneously. This thing called the multiverse. And he continues on by saying this, the multiverse concept can explain the fine tunings of physical law without the need of a benevolent creator who made the universe for our benefit. So he says God's no longer needed to make sense of this world today. It's clean enough. Physics is clean enough to make sense of this. Here's what Richard Dawkins, superstar... Um, Evolutionary theorist, biologist, also writes, Doc, Darwinism kicked God out of biology, but physics remained more uncertain. Hawking is now administering the coup de grace. So now with Hawking's work, with Dawkins' work, with Darwin's work, we don't need God anymore. Life is clean. Michio Kaku writes, quoting, rephrasing Arthur C. Clarke's work, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from divinity. So if you think you don't understand why things work and you just attribute that to God, just wait about 50 years and you'll realize you'll understand why it works. You don't need God anymore. You see, this is called the God of the gaps. We only need God to make sense of things we don't get. The problem with that is that at the end of the day, that's not how the world works at all. 
Let me give you this example about Da Vinci that I told you about. Let me just talk about one thing, just about five minutes of your time, about math and art. Look, we have math on one side, art on the other side. And here's what I've noticed. After studying this for about 10 or 15 years, here's what I've noticed. That if you really talk to artists and ask them, has math influenced you and how it has, they will say this arrow is true. They will say that if you take math, they have used math, they've understood math, they've read math, and has influenced their art. Great. But this is just me giving my identity to artists. I'm just giving up stuff. Here's what I want to know. I want to know, does this arrow exist? In what way has art pushed mathematics? You see, if you really want to remove the Enlightenment era in your world, in your sphere, in an academic setting, you've got to ask these hard questions. Look, there are mathematicians that I know who create art, but the art they create is not accepted by artists. And there are artists that I know who work on math, but the math they work on is 200 years old. Can you come up with something that takes cutting-edge math and at the same time produces cutting-edge art? Can we bring Da Vinci again? I don't think one person can do it, but I think a group of people can, but I think it's not easy. Let me give you some examples of a way to go in that right direction. Here's one, phylogenetic trees. What are phylogenetic trees? Based on our genetic, I don't care about evolution or not, I'd be happy to talk about that anytime you guys want, but based on just our genetic information, here's the tree of life. Right? This tells you genetically, based on our DNA sequence, how we're all related in terms of species, right? So if you want to know genetically where we are, we're right there, animals next to fungi, slime molds, plants. Those are the closest things with the same DNA structure that we have, right? The things that are way over here, like purple bacteria, kind of unrelated in DNA structure, the genetic compound that we are. So in science, we have this notion of structuring things. And if you want to tear down walls, here's one example of something beautiful that was torn down. I love this thing. This is a paper that came up in the journal Nature. Do you guys know Chaucer's Canterbury Tales? Some or might not, you might have maybe read a piece of it in high school. Maybe some of you are looking at it now. But uh, here's what we have right now. We have about 80 copies of the Canterbury, 80 extant copies. They're all different of the Canterbury Tales. And the problem is, we don't know which one Chaucer really wrote, right? Because they're all different. So which one is it that was sort of his original work? Now, we don't have Chaucer's handwriting. It's way too old to compare that stuff. But is there some linguistic analysis that we can do? Is there some textual criticism that we can do? And that's what we've been, done, what we've been doing so far. But these people, Adrian Barber, Christopher Howe, Norman Blake, Peter Robinson, their faculty in different departments in biochemistry, Human Research Institute, Division of Learning Development, they got together and here's what they said. Why don't we use the DNA sequencing machines that we have to tell the difference between plants and animals and purple bacteria and slime molds? We have that machine to tell those apart. Why can't we use the same ideas, break down the walls, and use those ideas to talk about Chaucer's work? So what is the DNA of Chaucer's work? You, know, you could look at the paper that was written in, but the paper, you can't do like carbon dating. It's way too crude. But if you think about it, the DNA of Chaucer's work are the words. The boy went to the store. That's the DNA. That's the GCTA DNA. So they took the DNA of these 80 manuscripts and they put it into a gene sequencing machine. And here's what they got. This is the tree they output it. And so this tells you how the Cha works of Chaucer are related to one another based on their word DNA analysis. So notice one thing, right? Notice that all the purple things in the bottom right, they're related to one another, which means that a scribe or, or somebody who is copying or translating or writing things down or moving it around made a mistake, and that mistake was propagated to all the other purple ones. Right? That DNA was sort of given into that group. And then over there, the black ones, some mistake was made, something was copied wrong, something was... And then that was kind of propagated to a different community of people reading Chaucer as it was written by scribes and copied over and over again. And same thing, but the most interesting thing are the, are the red ones. If you look at all the red manuscripts, they actually point right to the middle of that black dot. So what they believe is that if you have the red manuscript, you probably have the closest to Chaucer's original work. That's something that linguists weren't able to tell before. Of course, this is not a slam dunk. This is just a hint towards something to go for. But this is what it means to break down walls. This is what it means to not just look at the scientific world in one lens and the world of literature in another one. Here's something else. 
pop-up books. This is the work by Robert Samuda, Matt Reinhardt, superstar guys. The, uh, Matt Reinhardt has a book on Star Wars pop-up book. It's probably one of the most beautiful books I've ever seen in my life. It's incredible. Uh, they have a whole collection of books on dinosaurs. But to me, these are works of art. In fact, I'm teaching a course on origami uh, next semester, when the, our semester starts in a little bit. And uh, one of the course modules is for my students to make pop-up books. And it's incredibly difficult. It's incredibly hard to understand how that works. But let me give you a little snapshot of what's going on. Remember the Burton Russell's quote from the pitiful facts of nature, what can we learn, right? What's going on about nature? Nature can teach us nothing. We want to escape this dreary world, is what Burton Russell said. But we see if we actually understand nature a little bit, you get this beautiful way of talking about Chaucer and the works of art that we care about. If you understand nature a little bit more, you get things like origami folding. So these are ferns. Many of you have seen these ferns before in the mornings. Here's what ferns do. Here's what plants do. They do origami folding when they're curled up at night. They open it up in the morning. Have you ever wondered, in fact, you will see this in a little bit, but have you ever gone out in springtime and one day the, the trees are sort of bare and within like a week everything is green? Like it just happened like out of nowhere. And here's what's happening. The way plants grow their leaves when they're young if they're growing their leaves, if they absorb light at that time, photosynthesis is actually dangerous for them. So you don't want photosynthesis for young objects, these young little plants that are growing. But at the same time, if they wait till they're ready to have photosynthesis, if they're ready to absorb that light, then they can't grow their leaves fast enough. Then they're going to die. So here's what plants do. They grow their leaves out, but they keep them curled up. Right? They keep them flat folded. So when the right time comes, like solar panels, they come on out. And that's why all of a sudden it looks like spring, because they've already been waiting to come out. So this notion of origami folding, this way of capturing information is built into the very natural objects you see in the world around you. This is another notion of origami folding. I call this one-dimensional folding. It's in your body. It happens over and over again. Proteins. The way proteins fold in your body is a stick comes, it kinks a little bit, another stick comes, it kinks a little bit, keeps going like this. You have this incredible kinked three-dimensional key. And this key can go and unlock and interact with enzymes and do certain things based on the structure of the key. Now, if the key has incorrect folding, if it's kinked the wrong way, you get mad cow disease. If it's kinked the wrong way, you get Alzheimer's. All of this is coming from proteins folding incorrectly. And your body is making proteins over and over again all the time, all the time, all the time. James Webb Space Telescope is designed on this origami folding principle. This telescope, which was supposed to be launched in 2015, is now pushed back by NASA to be 2018. It is the size of a tennis court. If it gets out there, it has a thousand times the resolving power of Hubble. It's going to crush anything we can see in the sky. It's going to be incredible. But here's a catch. How do you take a tennis court and put it in space? And the answer is, you fold it. So the James Webb Space Telescope actually folds inside a rocket inside a spaceship. You have too many creases to fold, and the resolving power goes down. You have too little creases, and you can't fit it into the object. So all we're doing is we're looking at nature, ripping it off, and trying to understand what nature can already do. Let me show you something else. This is the Korbayashi stent. This was designed by a student. She was a medical student. She was visiting her friend in Kyoto. She went to the Japanese museum, origami museum, just for fun one day, and she noticed this thing, this kind of special folded pattern. And she realized she could do this for stents. A stent is something you put inside your artery to open up clogged arteries because you've eaten too much ice cream. Right? So that's, that's what a stent does. It opens it up, and here's what this thing does. It goes from here to here. Right? It's this incredible opening that happens because of this thing. Something that's incredibly small can open up into something incredibly big. So you can put it inside the artery easily, and you can open it up very strong. This is now a $2 billion industry because of just those origami techniques. And this is probably the closest to reclaiming da Vinci that I know of, closest to what we have about going back to the time of Leonardo. There's a guy named Eric Demain. I'm not sure if you know him at all, but you should. I think he's about 28 now, but when he was 19 years old, he got a PhD and, uh, in computer science. Brilliant superstar. He was, uh, got offered a job at MIT as a tenure-track professor. MIT says the kind of stuff you're doing is exactly what we're doing. This is the best job in the world. Everybody knew it, by the way. And uh, they said, we'll do whatever you want. Come on, come on over, man. We'll take care of you. And Eric goes, well, you know, yeah, I'm not sure. And then MIT goes, what are you looking for? I mean, this is it. This is the whole bore. What do you need? He goes, well, my dad's looking for a job. So your dad's looking for a job? What does your dad do? Well, see, he does, like, he's like a glass blower, and he, he blows glass. And so 
MIT built his dad a glass blowing studio two floors below Eric. They made his dad a visiting professor at MIT. And together, they have now written 300 papers. Eric won the MacArthur Genius Grant at the age of 25. And this is some of their work they have in the Museum of Modern Art in their permanent collection. MIT is not stupid by building that studio for his dad. It's incredible. Eric, uh, he's actually a friend of mine. We've written, uh, we've done work together. But this work is one of the cutting edge ideas that we have in terms of math and CS. We don't know how origami of a piece of paper folds and forms curves. This is just from a flat piece of paper, but you're getting curves. And we don't know it. We don't understand it. I mean, like, we have these rudimentary ideas of what's going on. But the theory behind curviness that you get from folding pieces of paper, we don't know. Unsolved area of research. But all coming and motivated by things in nature. And this is a work that's uh, incredibly pushing the bounds of art in that sense. So let's go back to this just for a second again. Remember this picture I told you guys about, right? About how we're cutting up this world into pieces. On one side, we have math. One side, we have art. We're trying to make everything so clean and so sterile and so simple. Just the way Russell wanted it, somehow to escape from these pitiful facts of nature. My friend, it's way more complicated than this. Let me just close with a couple of ideas. First of all, our faith. Right? To me, I'm a Christian. If you ask me about my faith, there's nothing scientific about it. Right? It's extremely based on one notion, and that's historical. And if you think about anything in history, you realize that it's messy. So let me ask you a question. Do you believe that Abraham Lincoln was a president, was a former president of the United States? Everybody in this room probably say yes. Do you believe that he was killed? Yeah. Do you believe he was shot? Well, what scientific evidence do you have? Prove it to me. Like, convince me. Convince me that he was shot. What do you have to do? You have to look at historical text, but that's not scientific. It's not a repeatable experiment. You can't shoot the guy again and again and say, well, he's, he keeps dying. Yeah, that's working out. Check. Right? <laughs> you see, the funny thing about history is it's exactly not scientific. It's not repeatable. It's just a one-time thing. Here I am at this time, at this morning. It's done. Right? It ain't going to happen again. And that's it. This one shot, that's the historical notion. And the Christian faith says that God is a God of history. He's not unlike the God of Islam, who is one who exposits information, gives it to you in the Quran, which is perfect, in God's perfect book, in the perfect language of Arabic. The Christian faith is actually just the opposite. It's not a God who gives you perfect things. He's a God who rolls up his sleeves and comes down into the muck and yuck of this world, into the mess of this world and hangs out with us. Right? He's not willing to step back. He's willing to step in. That's the incarnation, and that's the power of the resurrection. It's the God of history. It's incredible, right? And if you actually look at Scripture just for a second, Scripture is actually really weird because it's not clean. And it's not easy to translate. It's broken down over tons of time. It's not the Quran. It's not elegant. It's in, yet, in that sense, it's still gorgeous. Let me say one other thing. This is N.T. Wright, by the way, who... Um, I recommend this book. It's an incredible book, along with almost anything N.T. Wright says. But N.T. Wright is a historian who studies the Second Temple era, the time during the time of Christ, and wants to know the historical nature of what people were thinking during the time of Jesus. Some of the greatest defense of the Christian faith that I know of is from historical perspective, and N.T. Wright is one of the leaders in that field. Here's another book that I want you guys to, uh, to think about. It's a book by Robert Alter, who's a professor at UC Berkeley. I was a sabbatical there. I was at sabbatical at Berkeley about four or five years ago. I drove up to Vancouver to see my friends in, um, for Thanksgiving. And one of my friends who was there said, oh, so you must have met Alter. You know, Alter's right there in Berkeley. He's like, who's Alter? I don't know what you're talking about. He says, you're an idiot. And he gave me this book. And when I started reading this book, I cried every night. So I'll tell you who Robert Alter is. Robert Alter is a professor not of history or theology. He's a literary critic. Right? That's what he does. He's a, he's a man who studies literature. He's a professor at Berkeley, superstar guy, amazing guy in the field. And what he decided this, over this time period is he actually knew Hebrew really well right, on the side. And he thought, why don't I use my literary powers that I know to understand the works of literature and use it on Scripture, on the Old Testament? Like, how does the Old Testament handle and, and survive under the lens of a, as a work of literature? You know, Shakespeare's awesome. Chaucer's great, but how good of a work of literature is the Old Testament? 
as a work of literature alone. And he says it's incredible. So let me tell you like a little snapshot about the messiness of the scripture that we have, all right? Just one or two things. In Hebrew scripture, the first words, especially in a narrative, in a story, the first words ever spoken by a character determines the identity of the character. That's not true in almost any, like if we're reading a book, we're reading Harry Potter, the first word that Harry Potter speaks, this is, oh my goodness, this character is captured in the word ha. Well, what do I know? I don't know what he speaks. But yet, in Hebrew narrative, it is crafted so much that the first words that you read about a character tells you the identity of that person. So let me tell you, remember the story of Rachel and Leah, the sisters, married Jacob? Do you know the first words that Rachel speaks, you know, the one that is the hot one that, you know, Jacob loves? The first words that she speaks is not when he meets her at the well and he's like, my goodness, you're great. It's not when they get married or he gets tricked, nothing. The first words she ever speaks happens near the end after they're both married, after Leah has lots of kids. The first words is in Genesis 30, chapter, verse 1. When Rachel says, give me a son or I will die. And so the authors are saying, of course, that's not the first word she really speaks, right? Who knows what she really says in real life. But the narrative is written to the point that that's how you should see Rachel. Her identity as to who she is is based as a mother that she's not. So here's a question for you guys. What's the first word that David speaks? King David, the man after God's own heart, right? That's the PR that we have, right? He is, oh, David, right? It's can't do no wrong. Well, there's a small Bathsheba thing, but forget that. Other than that, he's like, perfect, woohoo, and then we're back, you know. So uh, what's the first thing that David ever says? Is it when he gets anointed by Samuel as a little kid? Here I am, Samuel. I was in the field. Is it one of the songs? Like, what is the first thing that David says? And you realize the first thing that King David speaks, and here's a little paraphrase, it happens during the time of Goliath. When he looks at Goliath, and he's talking to his brothers and the army, and he goes, what does one get for killing the guy? It's actually a very calculated political statement. David is not saying, I love the Lord. David is not saying, here I am, God, or for the nation of Israel and the holiness. He's saying, what do I get if I kill him? That's the first word. It's a very political thing. In fact, the whole book of David is a rise and fall of this political man. He marries Saul's daughter, and yet so many times you see that Saul's daughter, Micah, says over and over again, I love you to David. David never once in entire scripture says, I love you to her. His best friends, Jonathan, is the king's son. Jonathan says over and over again, I love you to David. Never once do you find out that David says, I love you back to Jonathan. Well, that's kind of interesting. And what are the last words that King David says? His very last words in scripture in 2 Kings, and where he turns to Solomon on his deathbed, and he says, Solomon, in your wisdom, here's a rough paraphrase, but it basically says this, in your wisdom, make sure those two old men do not go to hell without having their heads covered in blood. He's basically asking a mafioso hit on these two men that he couldn't kill during his time because of promises he made, but he's saying, Samuel, now that I'm going to be gone, you can take him out. Those are the last words. See, this is what I love about Scripture, my friends. It is not ashamed to be messy. It is not a document of cleanliness. It is a document of the reality of the muck in which we live. And in this muck, even in a broken man like David who ignores his kids when one rapes the other, God chooses him. God adores him and says, you're after me. That is the God of mercy that I'm crazy about. Let me just close with one thing about you guys and Gordon. This is something that my students and I did. I taught a class on genetics a while ago, and here's a data that tells you about the alum at Williams. And this is an encouragement to you as you go out. On the left side of the circle are all the majors that you can make major at Williams College, which is quite similar to here at Gordon, right? And we broke it into 15 big groups. So you can major things in history, poli-sci, econ, English and lit, art and music, chemistry, right? It's 15 big groups. Every major is one of those things. On the right side is every career that a Williams alum is in right now. Again, broken into 15 different groups. So banking and finance, government, K through 12 education, health and medicine, engineering. And for every alum, there's a line from one thing on the left to one thing on the right. And here's what you see. You see the following thing. That if you're an English major or a lit major, okay, so more people from English kind of going into K through 12, maybe going 
go into writing and comprehension, but they go everywhere. So somebody majoring in English, they can basically do anything they want. And here's what somebody doing in history. Yeah, there are more people from history going into law. That makes sense because you're sort of self-selecting, but all the other guys going into history are doing everything. They're going into health and medicine, college education, writing and communication. And here's somebody going into econ. Yeah, sure, more people going into finance and banking, as you'd expect, but they're going everywhere else too. And what about this other side? What if you want to do sales? What do you have to study? Whatever. What if you want to do banking? What do you have to study? Whatever. Doesn't matter. <laughs> College ed, it doesn't matter. And here's the thing. We get so wrapped up into cutting our world in our academic world as students right now into pieces that, yeah, I know what kind of job I want because I'm 19 years old and I really have it together. No, you don't have it together. <laughs> you have no clue what you're talking about. But the punchline is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The world is not partitioned into the pieces that people think it is. I encourage you guys to push hard. I'm going to close with this last quote from one of my favorite books, The Princess Bride. <laughs> it says, life is pain. Anyone that's this different is selling something. You see, that's what it means to try to come back to the Renaissance again. That's what it means to lead a messy life again into the life that God calls us here. It's not easy, but that doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Thank you for your time.